changes. What's up, Wastelanders? Boys and girls, prepare to be astounded, bedazzled, and otherwise stupefied. <laughs> you talk a lot. Sound funny when you talk like a stupid human. <laughs> I am online once again. Tremble world before my electric heating coil of doom. <laughs> What's up, Wastelanders? Hello and welcome to Tapes from the Wastes, a Fallout fan podcast bringing you game discussions, lore talk, and all things Fallout. I'm one of your hosts, KDB, and as always, later, you will hear from my co-host, Eric, aka Sulior. Welcome, as always, thank you for listening. Hello, new listeners. Hello, old listeners. It is a beautiful day here in the south of England. It's a bank holiday weekend, which means it's a three-day weekend where lots of people get Monday off work, uh, except for me. I don't get Monday off work, so it's no three-day weekend for me. <laughs> um, if you are in the UK and listening to this and you get Monday off, well, good for you. I don't. I still have to work. Um, but yes, I do have a day off today. It's Saturday. Uh, the weather is amazing. I've had a nice day out with the family. But I've got a bit of time and we've got a new episode of Tapes from the Waste to get together. Um, This is, uh, what is this episode? So yeah, today we are bringing you some Fallout news uh, in the form of our reactions to the Fallout 4 next slash current gen upgrade. Um, And then some TV show news and other little bits. And then also we have a law section. Eric is bringing you some law on... A very topical subject right now and that is the law of the ghouls in fallout some ghoulish law is coming your way later in this episode um yeah but before we dive into that um as i say hope everyone's okay how are you um i think it is important to take that moment to welcome some of our new li- new listeners because and i don't want to you know kind of uh, ignore our returning listeners and our loyal listeners we love them too. But yeah, obviously Fallout is continuing to have a bit of a moment and we have had on this show, um, well, we've had like some of the biggest growth we've ever seen. We've had huge, huge spikes in downloads and even views on our tiny little YouTube channel. Um, Our most recent episodes of Tapes from the Waste covering the TV show saw some of our fastest growth ever for an episode, which, you know, is like Fallout... I'm not not acting like they were some kind of fantastic masterpiece podcast episodes. Fallout is in the conversation right now. And we are just so glad that the people that have been searching for Fallout content have discovered us. And not only us, because I know it's not just us, you know, getting this Fallout wave. Uh, many of the other amazing Fallout shows out there who Eric and I are both fans of. And of course, Eric actually appears on numerous Fallout shows as well. So... Um, yeah, you can sort of find him, find him everywhere <laughs> in the Fallout content creator dumb. Um, but usually I'm just on here. Uh, and that's because a lot of the other shows are American shows and time difference thing. I've talked about it before. It's just kind of hard to organize that thing. I'd love to be on those shows, but generally they're always recording when I'm fast asleep. So, so yeah, but yes, thank you to everybody that has discovered the show, um, yeah, it's uh, it's been it continues to be a wild time in Fallout, and we've got some news to talk about, and a bit of gameplay, and then, as I said, some lore as well. So let's start with the news. Top headline: We have Fallout TV show nets sixty five million views in its first two weeks. Now, of course, we're fresh off the back of the TV show, and it's still in the news this past week. Uh, with 65 million views. I have a Variety article here. So this was announced via Twitter, uh, but I'm just going to read from this Variety article um, because there's an interesting fact here. So yes, Fallout is proving to be far from a nuclear bomb for Amazon's, Amazon's Prime Video. According to the streamer, the series pulled in 65 million viewers in its first 16 days of availability, with the first season dropping its entirety on April 10th. That makes it the second most watched title ever on the platform, 
And the most watched title since the debut is The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, back in 2022. Amazon also says the show is its is its most watched ever among adults 18 to 34, with 60% of the show's audience coming from outside the United States. In particular, the UK, France and Brazil have all proven to be hubs for the show's popularity. Which is fascinating, and I mean, you know, just the 65 million. It's so funny to think of where we are now from when this show was first announced. Where many fans... And not just Fallout fans, but just, you know, TV show watchers and pop culture fans in general know that video game adaptations don't have a great track record. Um, And then in in more recent years, they've kind of got better and there's a a better hit ratio. You know, whether you like them or not, they're they're kind of proving successful and, and being kind of mild critical successes as well. But, um, yeah, there was always a big question mark about Fallout, but... As we've talked about on our two review episodes, uh, we love the show. The show has absolutely smashed it. And it's been amazing to see new Fallout fans and lapsed Fallout fans come back and enjoy the show. And 65 million viewers. uh, And this is, you know, this data is like a week old now. Um, So add a few more million onto that, I expect. Because I still see people online talking about it, saying, oh, I haven't finished it yet. I haven't finished the show. I'm still watching. I'm, I'm only a few episodes in. And these are people that are Fallout fans as well. So not everyone has time to watch it all straight away. And yeah, just kind of big congratulations to everyone involved with the show because they are insane numbers. To be to, to think that Fallout has a pull as big as The Lord of the Rings, that's just that's completely bonkers like to think about that and it's no accident it's because the show is good and okay not everyone might love the show but the show is made very well it's been executed very well it's written well acted well performed well and it looks great I think you know just from a broad objective standpoint it's a solid solid tv show and word has gotten around about how fun it is and how kind of you know brutal it is and gory and weird and quirky and the music and the whole theme all the themes of fallout which everyone loves and now have now transcended the games into this very successful tv show so big congratulations for that um slightly connected to that is todd howard um who gave an interview to kind of funny and this kind of ties into one of the other main news topics that I was going to talk about but as an addendum to the 65 million viewers uh what did he say so uh Todd Howard said that the cast the cast and crew that the crew of the show were 3D printing things for the show from game f- files Bethesda sent them which is awesome to hear um I have a quote here which is from the interview uh with kind of funny The quote is, I thought there would be more movie magic. I thought they're going to fake a lot of stuff and it's going to be a lot of CG shots. And then he said, you step in and they've built this two-story vault and the lights are all there. They're not fake lights. The buttons work. It's incredible attention to detail. A lot of the credit goes to Howard Cummings, the production designer on it, who is just really meticulous about translating every little thing. We were sharing the files right from the games and they were 3D printing things. Howard would apolog- would apologise when they had to change the scale of a hallway, <laughs> which is quite funny to hear. And yeah, this is, um, I mean, it's just cool to hear that because I think anyone who's watched the show, it's really evident how cool the practical sets are. And of course, you know, there's CG in the show and there's ex- background extensions and all this kind of stuff and CG effects. But there's so many practical sets inside and out the costumes the weapons it's yeah it's in this day and age where films you know from the mcu and such are filmed basically entirely in front of a green screen and and you can tell as well when you watch it the sort of the sense of scale and life disappears from those movies um and some tv shows i think a lot of the halo tv show is green screen certainly season one was um, but here they went all out in the practical, which isn't cheap. You know, that's that's Amazon money for you. It helps and it really paid off. It just gives the show so much texture. So I thought that was cool that they were actually using stuff from the games and 3D printing things for it. 
Uh, next up we have, and so this is also from the Kind of Funny interview. So basically Todd Howard did like a 40 minute interview with Kind of Funny where he talked about a lot of stuff. Um, but there was a lot of Fallout stuff in there. Apart, So we just mentioned that stuff from the show there. Uh, but he re- he revealed and or mentioned some bits about Fallout overall and the future and the roadmap because there's been a lot of questions about that. Um, so yeah, so where let me just pull up my notes here. So yeah, when Todd Howard was asked about the future of Fallout, and I think um, uh, Greg, the host, said something. Had they considered like ramping it up or outsourcing the next Fallout game, uh, or what's coming? Is there any what unannounced Fallout's projects are coming? And Todd Howard said, uh, we look at what we are doing with the Fallout franchise and then we say, do we still feel good about it? He says, I can't reveal it now, but there is our runway for Fallout as a franchise. Season two of the show is happening. We've got what we're doing on mobile, what we're doing in Fallout 76, what we're doing with this thing and this other thing. And when are these landings? And again, if I could snap my fingers and have them all out and ready, I would. But the main thing is how we deliver these at a high quality level. That is always the most important. And that's cool. Like, you know, I, I there's still a bit of discourse going around about how, you know, Bethesda should have dropped Starfield and put all their resources into Fallout, which is also really annoying to hear when... Um, <clears throat> In a time where everybody's been begging for new IPs and then Bethesda do a lot for a new IP and then people are like, oh, I don't want that new IP. I want the old thing that I love. So, yeah, I don't think they should have dropped Starfield for Fallout. Um, but there's no there's no reason to say or to think that they aren't now going to slightly adjust their strategy and ensure that Fallout is being looked after but being delivered properly. Um and that high quality is still there. And I don't think they should rush it. I really hope they don't rush anything, but that doesn't mean they can't bring in extra teams. And I'm sure Microsoft is having meetings like, look, we- <laughs> here's a few extra million, you know, let's get this this factory pumping, get things moving. People are loving Fallout. So it's cool to hear that. I mean, we always knew, you know, there would be more Fallout stuff in the future. We knew it was a long time away, but... I I think absolutely the success of the show will have accelerated whatever is coming for Fallout. Not accelerated in a rushed way, but it will have made them look at what that roadmap is and when it's happening and ensuring that it's done properly. And Todd will want that because, you know, although he doesn't own that IP anymore, it's his baby at the moment. And yes, I know he didn't create it, but, you know, he's the current uh, steward, if you like. So what are these things he's talking about? Could one of them be... The Fallout 3 remaster, which has long been rumoured, you know, remaster slash remake, a new Vegas remaster, maybe a Switch port for Fallout 3. It's so weird to me that Skyrim is on the Switch, but Fallout 3 isn't and Fallout New Vegas isn't. That is a double pack that I would buy, you know, yesterday. Um, But yes, I think we can assume that Fallout 5 is one of them, but that's a long way away. And... Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what else they do. I just don't think, um, you know, we're not going to see anything next week, but I think people that were saying that the next Fallout game is, oh, it's not going to be here this in the next 10 years, it's a decade away. I don't think so. I think it will be here sooner. I think you will see something, and whether that's a spin-off or a full remake of 3, something will be here by 2030 you know no problem it's only 2024 it's yeah something will be here before 2030 in my opinion or maybe i'm just hoping um todd also mentioned that he sees fallout set staying set in the u.s um rather than you know seeing other locations around the world and his reason for that was that he felt that felt that so much of it of what fallout is is about the americana and the naivete of the united states um, he also was pressed again in the same interview about New Vegas and the rumours that he doesn't like New Vegas, which of course is not true. And about that, he said, uh, I do have another quote here. He said, first I'll say Obsidian did, ama- did an amazing job with New Vegas. And I'll say to everybody, 
that's a game that we published. <laughs> and I would say that Fergus, who runs Obsidian, is absolutely one of my favorite people in the video game industry. New Vegas is a very, very important game to us and our fans. We think they did an incredible job. If anything, the show is leaning into the events of New Vegas. Yeah, which people who've seen the show will will understand. But go, you know, go and watch that full interview with Todd on Kind of Funny because there's, you know, he talks a lot about Fallout, Starfield, and all things Bethesda and stuff that's going on. It really is worth watching. Um, yeah. Right. Let's get into the big meaty item, which is um, the Fallout Four next gen slash current gen upgrade is here. And it's a bit of a mixed bag with some good stuff and some, frankly, bizarre problems, uh, even by Bethesda's standards, <laughs> which, you know, we love them for it. So, <clears throat> the update is here. Let me pull up my Eurogamer article because they had some coverage on it, which I was referring to. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Yeah, Fallout 4's next-gen upgrade is here. Bugged on Series X and X, disappointing on PS5 and PC. Weirdly undercooked, despite resolution and frame rate improvements on console. So, yeah, they announced this uh, two years ago now. Two years ago, and it's finally here. Um, to summarise, so uh, on PC, the update introduces ultra-wide display support... Uh, but it seems to be lacking in polish and there are visual bugs, specifically with the UI being stretched across the screen. Uh, on PC, additionally, loads of mods have been broken and major issues from the original release remain undressed, uh, undressed, unaddressed, such as the 60 frames per second frame rate cap and lack of HDR support. Um, and I'll give my thoughts on this in a minute, but I'm just giving a summary of what this update has brought or, or the issues that it's brought. Um, on consoles, the upgrade brings a resolution boost and 60 frames per second performance mode, but there are bugs and visual downgrades compared to, compared to the previous gen versions, and this is the important part. The Xbox versions are particularly affected, with the performance mode toggle not working properly and the lower visual settings... With the performance mode toggle not working properly and with lower visual settings than even the Xbox One X version. Here's a quote from the Eurogamer article. Um, the more glaring problem, though, is that because the Xbox consoles are stuck in this performance mode, the visual settings such as foliage, object and terrain are actually lower than what we had playing on the last gen Xbox One X version now on the Series X. For all the build up to this big next gen patch, so to speak, the results take us one step forward and one step back. We get 4K at 60 frames per s, 60 frames per second now, but the draw distance settings are worse than what we had before. With the Xbox app upgraded, there is no way to switch back to the last gen app to restore these settings. Yeah, frustrating. Um, what else? So yeah, obviously it's out on PS5 as well, and apparently the, the PlayStation 5 version fares a bit better with true 4K resolution and improved settings in 30 FPS quality mode compared to PlayStation 4 Pro version. However, on PS5, some settings fall short of PC Ultra presets, and there's more performance drops. So, you know, there's no ray tracing, for example, which has kind of come to be expected with quality modes. And apparently on PS5, the draw distance is still quite poor with building textures not showing up as they would on a PC with those high settings. So yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, my feelings on this. Um, I have So I have played it. I've experienced the next-gen patch. I fired it up. And I will say, I did notice that when... And I'm obviously on a Series X... I went to flick between the performance and quality mode. And for those that don't know, you know, and you know, some people do not care about this. I know uh, like Eric doesn't really care. He just wants the game to not have bugs and to run smoothly, which is fine. And so do I. Like I can enjoy, you know, I love Starfield at 30 frames per second. It's just yeah. Um but it's I think it's important to sort of contextualize an a one specific fact here and that this is the Xbox version appears to be in worse state than any of the other versions and xbox are supposed to be the people putting this out it's supposed to be an xbox game now so yeah and i fired up the fallout 4 next gen patch and the the performance mode 
to me looked great. It looked awesome. It was so super smooth and you can tell, you know, right away it, it does look good and it feels and runs smooth. And I spent, you know, two or three hours, maybe four hours over two nights revisiting Fallout 4, just kind of popping some old achievements. Uh, I actually weirdly, because uh, the update has brought some uh, new quests, some like mini quest lines as well, which I haven't finished yet. But um, so, yeah, we got the technical stuff and then we got like the content, the quests, and there was some creation club content as well. Uh, but what's what's funny is I actually went back and cleared up some stuff in Far Harbor, which I'd finished the Far Harbor quest line, but there was like a Far Harbor achievement I hadn't got and just some other bits, locations that I hadn't visited. And I spent a lot of my time there, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. Um but I, yeah, I loved dipping back into Fallout 4 and I had so much fun. I spent some time, uh, I did a funny tweet about my camp uh, because I went back to my very first save and I looked at um, the building that I was doing in the sanctuary and <laughs> I was just like, what is this mess that I built and put a screenshot out there. And I think people got a kick out of it and because lots of people can relate that, you know, your first build is maybe not your best. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of us have, um, yeah, had some not so pretty um, builds on our original saves in Fallout 4. But I did notice that, okay, it looks great. And I thought, oh, cool, let's check the quality mode. Because, you know, from my my personal preference, I've said this before on other shows that I do. I do love high frame rates and smooth performances in games and stuff. Um <clears throat> But the 30 FPS filmic look, it's not a killer for me. I happily will play, I play Dead Space Remake, Alan Wake 2, all on 30 FPS. Because usually with the 30 FPS, which is what's known as a quality mode, you're supposed to get, you know, better fidelity. So a higher resolution, um, sometimes better lighting, um, you know, ray tracing, um foliage textures you know nothing hugely extravagant but just some little bit of extra depth that you don't get with the performance mode which instead gives you the higher frame rate instead and it just runs smoother and um yeah so i was like oh this does look really smooth and i'm gonna you know i'm enjoying this but i'm gonna check out the quality mode and see how it pops in that sense and i did notice straight away that um yeah, it's not there. <laughs> On Xbox, the quality mode literally doesn't work. Bethesda said or claimed that it's working as intended. But if you watch, you know, any comparisons, you can see that this surely cannot be the case. Because even on the PS5, where it's working... Um, the PS5 on quality mode next to the Xbox on the so-called quality mode... There's more foliage and, yeah, better textures and better draw distance on PS5. So it's just really frustrating that Xbox players seem to be getting the worst of the update issues um, when it's supposed to be an Xbox game. And I'm not saying Xbox should have priority. I think everyone should just get the same thing, but it doesn't make you feel good. And I, so I did notice that and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then a couple of days later, I saw all the breakdowns and people kicking off about it. And I was like, oh yeah, I noticed that. So that was kind of annoying. And I assume they're going to patch it, but they did say it was working as intended. And I haven't seen recently if they've changed their mind about that. Um, but surely you'll get updated. But I hear that the, the update did fix some major bug crashes throughout the game that people were getting. Eric's going to touch on his experience as well with some of that. So, yeah, my feelings are that, you know... And then these PC issues... Oh, and there was the other thing that PS5 players who had the PS Now subscription weren't supposed to have to pay for it, but then it wasn't letting them get the update for free, which has since been patched, and that was a bug, and that has been fixed. But there was just... There's this like myriad of issues across this update, which was promised two years ago, and it's very clear there's there is no way. Come on, there is. I mean, again, I'm not a game developer, so maybe I'm com speaking completely out of turn. If they were working on this update for two years, and this is what we got, that raises a few questions. 
I highly doubt that was the case. It's probably been a bit back and forth and juggling between other projects, between 76, the show, and and Starfield and whatever. I don't know who's working on the update, but... Like, for example, the ultra-wide support for PC and the fact that the UI is stretched. Like, you can look at that, and anyone will look at that and go, okay, that's clearly wrong and broken. It's shocking to me to think that a studio of this size and this caliber and a game of this and this update that was promised would put this out with that visual error. And it's like, again, it raises questions. It raises two questions. One, did they did they test it? I'm sure they did. But did they test it and see it and go, ah, that's good enough. We haven't got enough time to fix it. Just get it out. We're not spending any more resources. So... Which is disappointing because I I, pers- I don't play on PC, but I know personally people that play on PC, that play ultra wide and were specifically looking forward to this specific feature and they've got to deal with this horrible, ugly UI. I think even the ultra wide ratio wasn't correct at first and that's since been patched, but the UI is still stretched. And when I say UI, so I mean things like, you know, your HP bar and the map, um, the compass, which you can turn off, but you, know, you shouldn't have to turn that off. So... Yeah, what, I don't really know what's going on there. It's it's crazy to me to think that they were working on this for two years. It feels a bit rushed and farmed out to obviously get out along with the hype of the show. And that's good. And that makes sense from a marketing and sort of, you know, a just, you know, rewarding your players and helping and encouraging people to play the game. It made me jump back into Fallout 4. But it feels a bit like, uh, really? You, you you missed these things and left and you left all these bits out. So, yeah, I'm not going to cry about it. <laughs> I'm not going to lose any sleep. And I'm sure little bits, well, I say I'm sure, I think things will get patched and updated. But it is just a bit after, you know, Fallout is having this great run at the moment with everything. Everything has been so well. The game is just looking today. Fallout 4 is still in the top 10 of the Steam charts which, you know, doesn't even account for all the millions of console players as well. It's doing so well. Everyone's loving Fallout and all the feedback is great. And then all of a sudden they push this update out and everyone's like, it just it just taints it a little bit. And I think, oh, come on, come on, just put that little bit of extra effort in. So I don't know who did the update. It's weird that it went out like this. But, you know, it's complex and there's different platforms and different things to do. There's bugs they miss. I don't know. I'm not a game developer, but just from the end user point of view, some of it's a little bit disappointing. But I still love Fallout, and I still love Fallout 4, and I'm going to be playing it some more. Um, Yeah, that's kind of it for the news. I'm going to hand over to Eric shortly. I just wanted to, again, quickly touch on a, a little bit more gameplay. So as I said, I've been playing Fallout 4, but did I mention this on the show last time? I don't know if I touched on this on the TV show episodes we did but I've been playing Fallout Shelter (laughs) which is also amazing and Fallout Shelter got a huge update where they've effectively brought I don't say the entire storyline of the show but they brought new new characters characters from the show so the leads and even supporting characters we've got the snake oil salesman and we've got Marjun um and then we've got the lead characters Lucy the ghoul and Maximus but then to get each of these characters... Oh, there's also Snip Snip as well, which is the, the Mr. Handy from the show, voiced by Matt Berry. Um, they they added quests that tied into the themes of the show and the locations to go and get these characters. And I've been playing it, and I've been loving it. I have been utilising my uh, new phone. Well, it's a couple of months old now. I got a Samsung S24 Ultra and was getting back into mobile gaming a little bit. And it's so funny when I think about playing Fallout Shelter when it first came out, which was the around the same time as Fallout 4. Is that right? I'm, or am I being insane? No. Was it really that long ago? Fallout Shelter release date. There's people screaming at me. Yeah, 14th of June 2015. That's right. They they released Fallout Shelter when they announced Fallout 4, right? They were like, it's available now or available tomorrow or something. Yeah, I've been playing Fallout Shelter. Well, I haven't been playing it for 10 years. But I've been playing... That's when I first played it. Those first couple of years, I was playing it. And we've got a Fallout Shelter episode. But, you know, lest I forget. If you like Fallout Shelter, go and listen to our 
a retrospective episode covering that, um, featuring um, Andrew from the Fallout feed, who's probably the biggest Shelter fan out there. Yeah, I used to play it on the train all the time, and I played it on my phone, my iPad, and then it came to Switch and Xbox. I played it on all the platforms and loved it. And then, but I've, I've re-picked it up because I was excited about the show and using uh, my phone for mobile gaming a bit more. And then this update came to Fallout Shelter, and it just, it's just so cool to see, all right, okay, you can't get loads into 76 and stuff, and, and there isn't a new Fallout 5 yet, because, you know, 76 takes a bit more resources and all that. But Fallout Shelter was a really good way to kind of, you know, do that, um cross-media stuff and uh, I loved it I've had so much fun with Fallout Shelter and apparently what was it I read the other day Fallout Shelter um, I think it made like loads of money <laughs> um, yeah so gamesindustry.biz um, oh, I saw this shared by Jez Corden from Windows Central but he shared uh, an article from gamesindustry.biz Fallout Shelter's daily revenue rockets to $80,000 after the TV show debut. And there's this chart here which shows the the revenue made and the downloads from Fallout Shelter from like April 9th to April 13th. Or a bit further on than that. I might be reading that graph wrong. Downloads up 346%. Revenue up 232%. So it was making money already. But yeah, now it's, or re- as recently as the 1st of May, which is just a few days ago, this little mobile game raking in 80 grand a day. That is, that's, you know, that's not nothing money to Bethesda, to Xbox, to have that ticking over and numbers like that coming in every day. And of course, that's not going to last forever, but that's a huge injection of cash for I guess, minimal production um, because the game is already out there. They just added the update. So, I mean, and I've I've been tempted to... I haven't spent any new money on Fallout Shelter. I have in the past. I was just tempted to buy a few more uh, Nuka-Cola Quantums and you can buy the little packs on there. It's like five quid here, five quid there. I thought, you know what? Why not? I'm having so much fun with this game and spending so much time with it. I want to get a little boost and have some extra characters. And I limit myself. I don't mind spending a tenner on these games you know, reward the developers because I'm getting enjoyment out of it. So that was just kind of crazy to see Fallout Shelter making all this money. And yeah, Fallout really on a high right now and loving playing Fallout 4 again, loving playing Fallout Shelter, love the show. Please do go and check out our TV show episodes. We we did a two-part special. Eric and I gave reviews on part one and then part two we got together and there is a video version of part two on YouTube. Uh, with our faces in glorious HD, or should I say, ugh, it's terrifying HD. Um, yeah, where we got into spoilers and talked about favourite moments and season two theories and stuff like that. So, cool. Speaking of Eric, I am going to hand it over to him. I'm going to stop rambling. Thank you for listening to me. Go on. Eric's here with his thoughts on the Fallout 4 update and our special ghoul law section. Over to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And yeah, um, I'm going to be doing a lore segment today. This one is going to be on ghouls. Um, We are left with a few questions about the nature of ghouls in the TV show. And I mean, they, they kind of gave us a little bit of an answer to one of the mysteries that have been surrounding ghouls for a long time. But before we get to that, I wanted to go over my gameplay so, as you guys have probably heard, I've been playing a lot of Fallout 3 with the good people at the Fallout feed, and I just wrapped up Point Lookout. Uh, it's my first time playing Point Lookout, and it was <laughs> definitely ex- an experience. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. It was it was a little challenging, so I'm glad that Jess put this at the end of the round table. But, um, yeah, it... <laughs> It, it was definitely a good time. And I'm going to be doing Broken Steel here pretty soon. So I'm going to be trying to stream some of that um, this coming this weekend and um, 
depends on how long it is, maybe next weekend as well. But in other news, the Fallout 4 update hit us. Um, it was a long time coming. And, oh my god. Um, so, I personally really liked it. Um, it helped a lot of the issues that had been plaguing me. Um, the last feed or the last roundtable that we did with the Fallout feed was the Fallout 4 DLC on survival mode. And we were also assigned factions and all that good stuff. And I was assigned Brotherhood of Steel. Well, I've never done uh, I've never done the main quest in Fallout 4 with siding, you know, alongside the Brotherhood of Steel. But I play on Xbox mainly. And there's, uh, oh my god, the crashing was ridiculous. Um, I, I had struggled so much with walking through downtown Boston. And it was so unstable. Like, it would crash every few seconds. So... Even in Good Neighbor. So it was from about Good Neighbor East where I couldn't walk around without it crashing every few seconds. And not just there either. Um, there were some of the mods that they suggested to the uh, to play um, that I thought was interesting, like Radium Inc. I couldn't approach the Radium Inc. building without it crashing. Um, it crashed a little bit on the Far Harbor Island as well. Um, yeah, I couldn't, like, there was this one hotel on Far Harbor that it kept crashing um, to where I thought maybe I wasn't going to be able to finish the round table. But I couldn't finish the main quest. Um, it, I got so close before this update where you... Or take you take a vertebrate to the mass fusion building, and there's this threshold I couldn't get past, where you land on the mass fusion building, and I couldn't actually touch foot onto the building. Um, it would crash every time as I go to land on it. So for almost a year, it seems like that was left unfinished, and that really bothered me. But I did it after this update. I did it. And it has been so much fun um, going back and playing Fallout 4 again and not having to worry about it crashing on me. Now, I know there are some people who are like, well, you know, it, it doesn't work in you know, quality, you know, the boosted mode, whatever, quality mode. I personally couldn't give two shits about that. Um, <laughs> that's just me. Um, I know that'll probably get me some hate. But I, I don't care about 120 FPS, you know, things like that. As long as the game runs fine and looks smooth, like, I don't care if it's got 60 FPS, 120 FPS. As long as the game runs smooth, I'm fine. I just want to be able to play the damn thing. So, <laughs> and especially since, to a certain extent... I couldn't before. And you know what? The game looks great to me now. Um, I could even tell that there were some graphics enhancements. And not only that, but we did get some Creation Club content, and I enjoyed that too. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a little bit of a struggle. Uh, I did the, the quest um, where you hunt down the Enclave, and so you, you find where they're at, uh, like you follow a tracker and you find where they're at. There's a, a group of them. And there was one that was so fucking hard. Um, <laughs> it was so tough. It was this enclave that was in power armor and he had a flamer, but it was kind of like the cremator from 76 now where it would shoot balls of fire at you and it would kind of explode on impact. And he was killing me within one or two hits. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Well, it turns out I was also, like, I I wasn't playing in survival anymore, but I still had it set to very hard. 
But even after I set it to easy, he was still tough in killing me. So, yeah, eventually I got lucky and I killed him. And then it directs you to a base in the Glowing Sea after you deal with the terminal there. But, yeah, this is also where, like, they're all wearing X2 power armor. Um, which, I don't know if that was in the game before that. So, yeah, thank you, Bethesda. I've uh, been having a lot of fun with it. Again, I'm not a an FPS snob, but I'm sorry if that offends some people. But yeah, I, I, it's fixed so many issues that I had, uh, prior to this update. Like I can actually play the damn game and it looks beautiful in my opinion. Um, I know there are some people that have had issues. The one thing that I would say that has been an issue for me is that, um, well, and this, I don't know, maybe this is minor to some people, but I can't access my mods list um, to the extent that I could before. I saved and favorited so many mods that I thought I might use beforehand. Um, and it only shows about eight or ten of my mods that I had before. And also... I can't access the ones that I had through Bethesda.net. Um, I don't know why they're not showing up, and some of them just don't work. Um, Madrock uh, made the game freeze. I could download it, but it made the game freeze. Um, the Kelly household, um, I could even find that in the, the um, in-game mod menu, but it isn't accessible. I don't know what's going on. Maybe that one just doesn't work. Uh, but it's not even, again, it's not even showing the mods that I have through the website. So hopefully that gets fixed because there are some that I would love to play. Um, I, will, I, I don't have Tales from the Commonwealth anymore. And that is one that I loved. Um, I'm, I'm glad that it, there are some that I had before that I, I do have again, like my Katana mod that I was using throughout the round table. I still have that, and I still have a, a few others that I really liked. Um, but I just, I don't know. I don't know why the, the website and the game aren't talking to each other right now. Maybe it's just me. Um, if, if you are able to get in, and access that, let me know. But yeah, that, that's my one big complaint about this update. And hopefully that gets fixed. Other than that, playing a lot of 76 as usual, both on Xbox and PC. Um, I've actually reached at rank 100 on the scoreboard um, on Xbox, but <laughs> the way the new system works, uh, especially with that last page, I didn't have enough tickets to get everything, so I still have to grind a little bit. Yeah, that rank 100 page, especially, everything there is at least 100 tickets. It's kind of ridiculous, but I guess I just want you to keep playing. Um, I think I'm in the 90s as I'm recording this, like the mid-90s on PC. But yeah, having a lot of fun uh, meeting up with friends on both platforms. Um, wish I had a PlayStation because there's a, a chunk of the community that plays on PlayStation. But yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. Uh, really enjoying this uh, season. We're now uh, with uh, Aliens. And uh, I guess we're going to be getting the Mothman Equinox and Foshnot and Meat Week soon. So... But I'm really looking forward to that Shenandoah update, the Skyline Valley update. That'll be a lot of fun. And yeah, I can't wait to build there too. Since they made the uh, camp slot cap 10, I've got another couple of camps that I've built. I've bought all uh, of the camp slots. So I'm saving one for Skyline Valley and I'll probably build a Christmas camp when the time comes or hell maybe i'll get a jump start on it i don't know um just gotta find a spot to build it but yeah it's it's been fun i am not a professional builder by any means but i do have fun with it and yeah that's pretty much all i've been doing um although one of my camps uh, has a random spawn point 
that's right there and more often than not it's cryptids so i've been trying to get some good pictures of cryptids lately uh unfortunately mothman isn't one of them it's been either a sheep squatch or a blue devil or an ogla uh, but there's been some crazy random spawns that have happened there like i saw some settlers get attacked by an ant swarm um that was interesting <laughs> um yeah, uh, super mutants. Uh, there, there's all sorts of crazy things that happen there. So yeah, kind of like where I had that camp now, even though there's no body of water. That that's usually one of my requirements. Anyway, I am rambling, so let's get to the lore segment, and that is on ghouls. So ghouls have been around since the very first game, and as it turns out. They were actually around before the Great War. Um, yeah, you... Here, give me one second while I take a sip of my coffee. Sorry about that. So, it says here, and this is the uh, fandom wiki, that there were cases where controlled exposure to radiation was used to ghoulify pre-war people. Um, this was done, of course, ex first experimentally. But these people were trying to obtain immortality, of course, because you know that's usually how these sorts of horrors take place. But yeah, they were experimenting with radiation drugs uh, being tested somewhere in the Commonwealth. And it says here that that is um, like Hancock knew about this. And it's why he chose to sort out that last remaining dose of the drug. But we see them in Fallout 1. Um, <laughs> a lot of them are in Necropolis, which if you go back to a couple of different episodes, you'll know that, yeah, the people of Vault 12 are uh, the inhabitants of Necropolis. Their vault was intentionally left unsealed mostly sealed but not entirely but yeah a lot and not all of them were feral so even then there's feral ghouls and non-feral ghouls but let's let's back up a bit let's get into the background of ghouls so most ghouls were created in the great war of 2077 um, yeah, they were alive during the bombs, and that much radiation basically melted their skin. Um, and, but it also made them immune to it, in a sense. So ghouls have ridiculously long lives, and they are largely sterile. So, so much that the birth of Monica, who is an unaffected human child of two ghouls, two ghoul parents uh was described as a miracle and uh let's let's talk about monica for a little bit so saint monica is somebody who's really only mentioned in fallout 3 you don't really see her but apparently you know, you go to saint monica's church which is uh, of course the church in rivet city um, you talk to Father Clifford, and he kind of tells you the story of Monica, where yeah, he, he says that she has a miraculous birth, and that she was born to ghoul parents, and it's miraculous because all ghouls are sterile. And she was born as a human, not a ghoul, so of course they take this as a, a divine birth and go from there. But still, that actually is pretty remarkable uh, all things considered. Now, according to the Fandom Wiki site, the unnaturally long lifespan of a ghoul is also due to a mutation within the autonomic nervous system of certain individuals following exposure to specific combinations of ionizing radiation with wavelengths below 10 picometers, um, which is basically gamma radiation. So... The mutation in response to gamma radiation that produces ghouls disrupts the normal process of decay in the neurotransmitters along the spinal cord. So that has also kind of been a question as to who, be, how does the radiation determine, 
Like, what determines who becomes a ghoul and who just dies? So maybe this is something, like, there's, it's, maybe it's something with the person. Maybe it's, you know, how much radiation they get. Yeah, that, that's always kind of been a mystery. And who knows? Uh, maybe we'll learn the answer to that. Maybe we won't. Um, Bethesda likes to keep their mysteries close to the vest with some things. Um, this is an example of that. So um, here's, here's, here's a bit more here. So high levels of radiation are a crucial factor, but radiation poisoning, poisoning easy for me to say, typically results in death rather than ghoulification. Um, there are two primary ways in which ghouls can develop from a human. So there's irradiation and the gradual transformation. And the fandom wiki site actually has a picture, an animated picture of somebody who starts out normal and then just decays into a ghoul. It's actually kind of cool to watch. Um, so yeah, they, the, there's, yeah, they basically look like they get burned and then just slowly decay. Exposed muscle and flaking skin happens. Uh, damaged connective tissue characterized by the absence of nose and ears. That um, Although you do see ghouls that have noses. Um, somebody posted a picture of, like a side-by-side -side picture of this on Twitter. I can't remember who it was. I, I want to say it was Ranger Houston. Um, but I never really thought about that before. But yeah, nine times out of ten. Ghouls do not have noses. It also says here that maybe another factor is how close they are to ground zero, uh, to where the actual bomb hit. Uh, but you suffer burns and thermal radiation and survive somehow, miraculously. But transformation is typically faster and substantially more traumatic for the victim and results in generally much more horrifying a much more horrifying experience with exposed bone, asymmetric deformations, and extensive unhealed wounds. Uh, yeah, it sounds terrifying. Uh, it also says here that glorification is possible post Great War. Um, there's an example they bring up here in the Fandom Wiki page. Uh, it's Camp Searchlight, which is in Fallout New Vegas. And it, yeah, it's just it's a place that you can go and visit. It is in the area pretty close to where Caesar's Legion is. So yeah, I'm sure you can find a map that'll show you where it is. I guess the attack that happened there turned most of the people into ghouls. But it also emphasizes the fact that the nature of the transformation may lead to mental problems. So the trauma of transformation, which I can't even imagine what that's like um, can cause a mental breakdown which may uh, also be one of the factors as to who goes feral and who doesn't there's also a couple of pre-war ghouls that are seen in the games um, one is in fallout 4 with eddie winter who is the main antagonist for nick valentine um, yeah that, there's a whole story behind them him go play fallout 4 and uh the more you deal with Nick Valentine, the more you'll hear about that. And then there's also Desmond Lockhart, who is the one of the main characters in the Point Lookout DLC that I was talking about at the beginning of this segment. Um, total asshat. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, go listen to my feedbacks uh, with the Fallout feed if you want to hear me talk about Desmond. Yeah, he, he's a total jackass. But, yeah, um, I guess he was pre-war. I, I didn't pick up on that in the story. Maybe I just didn't talk to him enough or didn't listen to him enough because, again, he was a total asshole. Um, but both people saw the in inevitability of the Great War and wanted to do what they could to survive it. So they became ghouls. Um, and then there's also post-war ghouls. Uh, I mentioned Hancock earlier yeah he he took the drug and turned himself into a ghoul and you kind of find out why as you talk to him so we don't there's no set time limit or time frame as to how long ghoulification takes it could take anywhere from hours to weeks or even as much as a year depending on the uh, exposure to the radiation 
age doesn't really matter as far as ghoulification goes. Um, we see people who are older that are ghouls, and we also see ghoul children, um, like Billy in Fallout 4. And it's it, it's just kind of a sad thing to see. Most ghouls lose their hair, but that's not always the case. Uh, we do see examples of ghouls who still have their hair like Mort in 76, and it, it kind of makes sense. You would think that their hair would just get burnt off by the radiation to begin with, but I guess that doesn't always happen. Uh, another sign of uh, the ghouls is their raspy voices. Um, you know, they kind of talk like they are a Dunmer in the province of Morrowind. But um, that's not always the case either. And sometimes ghouls have somewhat normal sounding voices and there's a note on the independent fallout wiki page that um, according to Kalal Bognadov who is the voice director for a lot of Bethesda games ghouls who have recently mutated have less raspy voices kind of like Mort in 76 that I mentioned earlier I mean fallout 76 only takes place what 25 26 years after the bombs and also Hancock that I mentioned in Fallout 4. He became a ghoul after the bombs dropped, so it makes sense that his voice isn't as raspy. But yeah, as I mentioned, Kalal Bognadov, uh, or Bogdanov, is um, the voice director for Bethesda Game Studios for Fallout 4 and 76. Uh, he's a developer, so yeah, pretty cool. Nice little behind-the-scenes... Uh, a bit of information there but yeah one thing that always happens with qualification though is widespread necro necrosis um, other defender degenerative easy for me to say um, conditions um, arthritis I'm sure cataracts glaucoma I can only imagine what it feels like to walk around as a ghoul whether or not you know, like you're continuously in pain still from the the deterioration but, yeah, it, it's, it's really sad, as I mentioned. And there's a stigma that goes along with it. Like, people avoid ghouls like the plague. And I, I can understand, and you do see this in the TV show, where Mama June was like, you're kind, I welcome here in Philly. It's because there's still a lot of questions about ghouls, whether or not... Um, it's a disease that people can um, get infected with. I don't, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that's not true. But the general population in the wasteland still doesn't really know. I mean, how would they? The, you know, so that's why people like 3Dog are trying to get the word out that, hey, ghouls are people too. Um, they're not monsters. They're not brainless. And unless they are feral, then yeah, they are brainless monsters. So kill them as many as you damn well please. But that's not always the case. But there's people are so terrified of ghouls for a number of reasons that they usually just get killed on sight without any question. Like, hey, are you sane? But they kind of have the, the same needs as any other person. They need to eat. They need to drink. Um, but they can go for long periods of time without it. Uh, Billy was in a refrigerator for 210 years. So, I mean, I guess they don't need food, water, or air for as much as a person. But they do eat and drink. It is kind of funny, though. You do see some examples of non-human ghouls in the wasteland. Like, you see ghoul gorillas um, in Fallout 4. You see Ruzka, in, which is a bear, in Point Lookout. Which, I need to go find that, because I didn't know that was there. I need to go find uh, Ruzka. You find a wolf known as the Beast of Beckley, which is another one that I haven't met personally, but I do know it exists. Um, you find a uh, ghoul Yaogwai 
in Fallout 4 occasionally, which I, again, didn't know that was a thing until uh, one of my recent hangouts with the Gato Pub. Um, that was that was interesting. And, um, yeah, you do see a few animals from time to time. There's legends of uh, ghoul blue whales. Um, you hear uh, people talk about that. But... Um, the biggest question surrounding ghouls is whether or not, you know, all go feral, and if not, what keeps them sane. And we did get some hints about this in the TV show, and I don't know, like, th there's the factor of how much radiation has people you know maybe that's part of it i don't know if that's true either because we do see sane glowing ones like jason bright in fought new vegas and so i mean i can't imagine how much radiation glowing ones have taken in but yet jason was sane and maybe that's because he felt like he had something to live for um, with the trip to the moon or wherever the hell they are. It's been a while since I played New Vegas. But, um, yeah, maybe it's just something to focus on and dedicate your life to that keeps you sane. Um, we see in the Fallout TV show that some of the ghouls were repeating their name to, uh, and that kind of helped them stay sane for a while. But that was only temporary. Um, like we see Bob go feral. Or he gets killed before he goes feral. But he's heading that way. He's in the process of turning. Um, Martha kept repeating her name. But she had gone feral. So what is it that keeps a ghoul sane? And if, if um, it is only a matter of time, how do they prolong that? So we see the ghoul taking a drug that um, it's assumed that that's what keeps him sane. It's never spelled out. Um, Bob had asked him if he had, or not, I'm not Bob, I'm sorry. His name was Roger. I don't know why I keep saying Bob. Um, Roger was um, asking him if he had any more of the drug and the ghoul said he was fresh out. So, is that drug what's actually keeping him sane? Again, it's it's strongly implied, but it's never spelled out, and it's it's it's, it, it's kind of shown that the drug can be used a few different ways. Um, like you can inject it, you can use it as an inhaler. Um, but is what what exactly is that drug? If is it only confined to California? Or, you know, that kind of, that area. But I don't think that's really true either, because we do see non-feral ghouls all over the place. If this drug is what's keeping them sane, why are there non-feral ghouls throughout the wasteland? Like, even in Fallout 1, uh, we do see non-feral ghouls that communicate, like Set, the uh, ruler of Necropolis. So, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to get an answer to that or not. And, but it, it is strongly implied that after a um, certain, you know, who knows how much time all ghouls go feral. So maybe it's just a matter of the, the ones that we have seen that are non-feral will at some point. Maybe something will make them go over the edge. Who knows? It's it's a mystery, and again, I think Bethesda likes having their mysteries. It keeps us inter it keeps us invested, gives us something to hopefully you know maybe one day they will play their cards or show them off. Who knows? Um, another uh, note from the Fallout Wiki or the Independent Wiki um, says that they didn't. They did have plans for ghouls, or for people to be born as ghouls in Van Buren. So, I mean, I guess that's not canon now, but it is kind of an interesting um, tidbit there. So, I guess there were going to be some other ghouls that 
were able to reproduce and they were going to make ghoul children. So, who knows? Maybe that's something that Bethesda will have down the line as well. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I could go on for a long, long time about ghouls, but I have a feeling that this episode is already going to be going long. So maybe I'll have a part two down the line uh, where I will talk about some you know, named ghouls. So I think that would be interesting. Uh, tell me whether or not you would like to see that. And um, I'm sure Kelsey will be telling you where to get a hold of me at the end of the episode. But I am going to hand this back over to him. And until next time, I will see everybody in the wasteland. Thanks, as always, to Eric for his contribution to Tapes from the Wastes. Always bringing the law. He is definitely the definitely the law master. Check out his other shows if you haven't already. He has an Elder Scrolls law podcast called um, uh, Tamrielic Adventures and Nintendo, which is a Nintendo, Nintendo pod, podcast or Super Nintendo, as it's called now, which he hasn't done for a little while, but it's still there. Um, and of course, Starfield Sandwich, which I'm on as well. Yeah, Eric is um, always bringing the law and does it so well. Uh, he has quite a soothing voice. I don't know if you've noticed that. So um, hopefully you learned something about ghouls. And that's not going to be the end of ghoul law. There will be some more to come. We are also considering uh, for the follow-up epi- follow episode to this. I can't even speak properly today. Um, we've got some more law coming. And it's going to, again, be something that ties back into the show. I'm not going to spoil it just yet. But we thought, let's do ghouls. Because they were a big feature of the show. And there's something else that was a big feature of the show, which we're going to focus on for the next law segment. So do stay tuned for that. Um, Yeah, that's about it. I mean, again, thank you for listening. If you like the show, please do rate us on Spotify. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Google Podcasts is obviously dead and going away. Um, Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Tell your friends, tell your parents, everybody. Um, and go and check out the other amazing Fallout shows out there as well. Um, come and follow us on Twitter. We are still on there for now, even though it's a bit of a very up and down website. We are at TFTW, TFTWpod. I'm going to do that again. We are on Twitter at TFTWpod. I've had a busy day. <laughs> um, Yes, come and follow us individually. Individually, I am K underscore D underscore B underscore, and Eric is at EN Gold08. Links in the descriptions to all the other shows and everything we do. We'd love to talk Fallout with you. Eric is basically playing Fallout 76 nearly every single day, um, and he welcomes people to join him, so please do that. Uh, he's been streaming as well. Yeah, he's. Uh, if, if you want to jump into 76 with somebody to play with, he's your man. So go find him on there. And reach out to him on Twitter as well. And yes, thank you everyone for listening. Um, We will be back again with another episode very, very soon. Until then, stay safe out there, Wanderers. Wanderers.